Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's the third week we've been back together here. Oh, let me I think. I, yeah, I am on here. And for me, it's just great to be back together with you guys. Um, it's not the same, of course, like watching on a screen and especially uh, this morning getting the opportunity to share the Word of God with you. That was just such a strange thing to be staring at a screen all alone in a room looking at myself. Like, just strange. Uh, not good. Um, but uh, yeah, let's uh, go before the Lord in prayer and then, and then we'll look at the Word together. God, thank you for your love for us, that you're holy, 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 and that we get to stand in your presence and worship you because of what Jesus has done for us. And that we can gather together as the people of God with the Holy Spirit who dwells in each of us because of what you've done for us. That's why we gather, and we are so thankful for that, that we could even do it in this limited capacity um, in in with what's going on in the world, God. We're grateful for that. God, as we look at your word this morning, I pray that you would speak to us through it um, and uh, help us to really see how it, how it pushes into our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, you can open up your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation 5, that's 12, page 1240 in your pew Bibles if you're using that. So just to give you guys a heads up as to what this morning is going to look like during the sermon time here, uh, I'm going to spend the first half of the time looking at a passage of Scripture, a couple of passages actually, and, and looking at how they really relate to our lives today. And then we're gonna, I'm going to invite Rachel up for the second half of the time, and we're going to share a little bit about our calling to go to Morocco and uh, really how we, what the ministry's like there and how we ended up uh, receiving this calling and, and kind of what our continued relationship with this church will look like. Uh, we had initially announced that over Zoom and that was definitely not the way that we wanted to do that, uh, but that was the option at the time. And, and we love you and we're excited about continuing like a relationship with this church as we move overseas. Um, and so uh, we're going to take a little bit of time toward the end of the sermon time and, and get to share. But before we do that, uh, let's go to heaven together. Who wants to, to go to heaven together this morning? All right, uh, not, uh, not literally in that sense, uh, but uh, the book of Revelation, the passages that we're going to look at this morning give us a glimpse as to what heaven's going to be like. Um, there's a common myth out there, and I'm sure you've heard it before, that goes, you can be so heavenly minded, too heavenly minded, that you're of no earthly good. Uh, and I would like to suggest just the opposite, actually. Uh, that as Christians, when we, when we gaze at heaven, we get a perspective about everything on this earth. And that the more that we think about heaven, actually the better will be for this world. The better citizens will be, the better neighbor you'll be, the better worker will be, the better spouse will be, and so on. And so what will heaven be like? What are we going to be doing there? And who are we going to be with there? Um, in the book of Revelation, John is given a glimpse of heaven. And in this particular portion that we're in this morning, uh, the scene actually begins in chapter 4, but it's kind of a long scene, so we're not going to look at uh, everything that's in there. But it starts off by John being in heaven a throne. And then he sees God the Father in all of his glory seated on this throne. And then surrounding the throne, so, so just try and imagine this in your mind right now. That's really what the, the passages are seeking to do. Around this throne, there's 24 other thrones. And on these 24 other thrones, there's these 24 elders seating on these thrones. And then surrounding the throne, flying around the throne of God, there's these different creatures. Uh, and all of these elders and these creatures in chapter 4 are all bowing down. It says that the elders are taking their crowns and they're casting them before uh, the feet of the Lord and they're worshiping God in heaven. Then chapter 5 comes along and John sees in the image of God the Father seated on the throne, he sees the image of a scroll. Uh, and the scroll has seven seals. And they, they probably weren't these neon pink strips of, of, uh, of whatever those little pieces of paper are. But that's what I had. Um, but he sees in the, the, the hand of God 
a scroll with seven seals. And so he's got to be thinking to himself, this has got to be an important document if it's in the hand of God. But who would be worthy to take this scroll from the hand of God and open it up and show us what's inside it? And so he's weeping because he doesn't find anybody in heaven who's worthy to open up the scroll. And that's where we're going to begin in chapter 5. Revelation 5, beginning in chapter 5. That's where the scene begins. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And so here John sees this image in heaven of two animals and two very different animals. He sees a lion, a strong, powerful, conquering lion. And then he sees a lamb in Let's leave this here for now. He sees an innocent and gentle lamb who's been killed, a lamb who's been slain. And then he sees this lion lamb figure that goes over to God and takes the scroll out of God's hand. And so we know from other passages of Scripture that this lion lamb figure is Jesus. And so Jesus takes the scroll from the hand of God. We'll pick up again in verse 8, 5 verse 8. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down. And worshiped. And so as soon as Jesus takes the scroll from the hand of God the Father, it evokes this increasing uh, scene of worship. It starts with the elders worshiping again, and, it, and then it moves to the, these flying creatures that are worshiping God, and then, it, and then it expands to thousands and millions upon millions of angels that are worshiping God. And then in verse 13, it says, I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, worshiping God. So this is the scene of global worship of God. Can you see the scene taking place in your minds right now? Is it it there? Uh, uh, There's so much to to look at here, but I I really want to hone in on verses 9 and 10. They're saying, Worthy is Jesus to open up the scroll because he was slain and by his blood he ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. It says that Jesus ransomed people for God. That, that means Jesus, he's purchasing people. That through Jesus' death, he buys us back from the dominion of the devil. That Jesus' death was for people from every tribe and tongue and language and people and nation. That Jesus' death has global implications. Jesus' death is for everyone. His death is for everyone. Jesus' death is for you sitting here in Geneseo, New York today, and it's for the person living on the farthest end of the earth, as far away as you can possibly get from here. Jesus' death is for your enemies. Jesus' death is for your personal enemies. Jesus' death is for our nation's enemies. And so in verse 10, it it, it says that Jesus' death, it makes us into a kingdom and priest to our God and that will reign on the earth. And the image here is, is saying that one day we're going to reign as kings. We're, we're going to rule in some mysterious way under the, the kingship of Lord Jesus that we're going to rule on the earth that even though we may have little power and influence now that we're going to be ruling in in some capacity. And it says we're going to be like priests. And what the priests did in the Old Testament is they served God day and night. And so that we're going to get to serve God perfectly day and night. And this, this is just a little glimpse at what the death of Jesus accomplishes for us as Christians. And so 
This is why Jesus is worthy of worship here. And so in chapter 6, as the, as the passage moves on, Jesus begins to open up the scroll. And he opens up, is it up one seal at a time. And he opens up six of the seals in, in the scroll in chapter 6. And he's beginning to reveal what's going on uh, in this document that God's uh, carrying. And we see within the scroll in chapter 6 that it's the judgment plan of God. It's the judgment plan of a holy God for a sinful world, a world that's living in rebellion against him. And we learn that this judgment is an answer to the prayers of martyrs, that this judgment is an answer to the prayers of those Christians who've died for their faith, who were killed. And, and, and it's displaying that God is one day indeed going to right every wrong. He's going to bring perfect justice on this earth. Uh, but then the question arises, well, what about Christians? Like, what about us? Are we going to be subjected to the, the judgment of God as well? And interestingly enough, this is a major theme in all of Scripture, and it goes back all the way to the book of Exodus, which we've been looking at, uh, it, which Pastor Mike has been looking at for many months here, where uh, as God brings judgment, it means one thing for one group of people, but it means something completely different for the faithful followers of God. And so just as in Exodus, the judgment upon uh, Pharaoh and Egypt meant destruction, it was salvation for the people of God. It, it was rescuing redemption for the people of God. And so it is the same with Christians today that the judgment that God pours upon the earth is going to be salvation for, for Christians. And so chapter 7, as, God, as Jesus is opening up the, and now my, now my scroll is completely open here in the humidity on the floor, but uh, as he's opening up this sixth seal and he's revealing to us that of what, what's going to be taking place for Christians uh, during this time. And so we can uh, pick it up in chapter 7, verse 9. Chapter 7, verse 9. Now as we, as we look at these few verses in chapter 7, I, I want you to look out for what's similar about this from what we just read in chapter 5. Chapter 7, verse 9. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation and from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And the one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. And they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. And the sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them into springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. It's an incredible scene. And it, it's following the pattern of what we've just seen in chapter 5. If you look at verse 9, chapter 7, verse 9 here, it says there's a, a multitude that no one could number from every nation and tribes and peoples and languages. These are the people in chapter 5 for whom Jesus died. They're here and now they're worshiping and they're saying the same things as that group of people in, in chapter uh, 5 saying. They're saying, worthy are you God. Salvation belongs to God the Father and Jesus the Son. And so we're, we're giving blessing and honor and glory and, and thanks. There's this seed of worship of, of, of the people of God from all over the world. And it's an image of victory. They're waving these palm branches around and they're wearing these, these white robes. Uh, and the robes are representing like a perfect purity, a, a righteousness uh, that they have. Verse 14 tells us, this is interesting, that their robes, they washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Now that is an interesting image. Like you can't make something white through blood, uh, but, it, but it's meant to, to grab our attention and, and show us that it's through the blood of Jesus that they're given these 
righteous white robes, that they're able to stand as pure and holy in the presence of a holy God. They're able to be seen by God as righteous and good, acceptable in the eyes of God. And therefore, they're allowed, we're allowed to enter into the presence of God in heaven and worship. And so whereas the judgment of God uh, is taking place upon the world here, for Christians, we're standing victorious and we're worshiping God forever. And then in verses 15 to 17, it gives us a little bit of a glimpse again at what heaven's going to be like. Verse 15, we'll stand before the throne of God and serving him day and night. We'll get to serve God perfectly. It says he'll protect us from evil. He'll shelter us with his presence. In verse 16, it says that there'll be no more hunger or thirst. And the idea is that all of our needs will be provided for in heaven. Verse 17, it says that the Lamb, Jesus, he's going to be guiding us. He's going to be our, our shepherd. And he's going to be leading us into springs of living water. That, that there's this image of, of contentment and, and satisfaction and ultimately life, eternal life. Verse 17 says that there's going to be no more tears and no more pain. That, that God is going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. This image is, is one of comfort, of one of, of guidance. And so as Christians uh, who've come through great trials, great tribulation here, many who've been killed from their faith, now they're victorious, now they're safe, and all they want to do is serve and worship and follow Jesus forever. And so these passages, they give us just a little glimpse into heaven. They don't answer all of our questions, but I don't know about you, but this sounds pretty good to me. Like, I want to be there. This is going to be good. I'm looking forward to this. You know, one time I was sharing this passage with the youth a number of years back, and a kid comes up to me and he says, that sounds pretty boring. Like, wearing robes, playing harps, uh, weird creatures, like, no thanks, that's weird. Uh, but if you think heaven's going to be boring, and <laughs> you don't get it. In heaven, you're going to be infinitely happier than, than you've ever been. You'll be doing exactly what you've always been created to do, what you've always wanted to do, even if, if you don't even know it right now, what it is. And th there'll probably be some things that you love doing now that you'll continue to enjoy doing in heaven. And there'll probably be other things that you love doing right now that you won't even want to do when you're in heaven. Uh, but the bottom line is that we'll be so in awe of God and what he's done for us that we'll want to serve and worship and follow him forever. This is heaven. Spend your time dreaming about heaven and it will change your life and it'll change how you live here even on this earth. And so what is heaven going to be like? Heaven's a place of victory. It's a place where we'll serve God. It's a place of protection. It's a place of comfort. It's a place of worship. And who will we be with? We'll be with everyone who trusts in Jesus. Everyone who's received this blood of Jesus, who's washed our robes in the blood of the Lamb. And everyone who's persevered in our faith until the end. No matter what kinds of rejection or sufferings or trials or tribulations in this earth that we've faced. And we'll be with people who are very, very different from us. You might be linking arms, worshiping next to somebody who looks different from you, who speaks a different language from you, somebody who is a different age from you. You might be worshiping next to somebody who has a different income level of you. You will be worshiping probably next to somebody who is of a different political party from you, somebody who has different opinions from you. Heaven is the ultimate equalizer. All the things that divide us here on this earth, of which there are many, they will no longer divide us when we're in heaven. And so I'd like us to consider, there's so much we could consider from this and how it relates to our lives, but I'd like us to consider just two implications of heaven's diversity. First, the diversity of heaven ought to affect how we live and treat our neighbors right here, right now. It ought to have an impact of how we treat our neighbors. I don't know about you, but when I read the news, like it just seems like our country is becoming more and more polarized. As the world of social media exposes us to 
every opinion out there, it, the temptation is for us to huddle together in little groups of people who, who are just like us, who, who think like us. Uh, and we read the news articles that, that tell us the things that we want to hear, and we delete the friends that voice the, the opinions that we don't like. And then you add onto that the stresses of this COVID-19 world, and, and pretty soon, your next-door neighbor, who you maybe used to get along with decently, they seem like, so, and now you haven't seen for a while, they seem like some kind of extremist, like lunatic, and, and you're trying to avoid them at all costs. Uh, but as Christians, our lives ought to look different. When we look at things from a heavenly perspective, we realize that while my neighbor may be very different from me, actually, they're really similar to me. Actually, my neighbor and I have a lot in common. My neighbor was made in the image of God, just like I was made in the image of God. My neighbor is a sinner just like I am, and my neighbor is someone for whom Jesus died, just like I am. And my neighbor might not believe that. And so this judgment of God that is being described in this book right here is going to come upon them, and their destiny might not yet be heaven. And so God calls us to love our neighbors. As Christians, we ought to be going out of our way to pursue relationships with our neighbors, with people who are very different from us. And so we invite that seemingly extremist neighbor over, and and we ask them about their life and about their work. We ask them about their family and and, and their interests, and we listen to them, and we look for commonalities with them. Uh, We ask maybe how we can pray for our neighbor and we look for ways that we can serve our neighbor. And then maybe one day we'll be able to talk about the things that differ from us in in, in a respectable and civil way. And Lord willing, we might build a relationship with our neighbor to the point where we can share Jesus with them. And they might be added to this huge multitude of people that are worshiping God in heaven. I mean, imagine if the Christians in this world spent more time investing in and loving our actual neighbors than we did trying to figure out how to solve all of the major problems of the world and complaining about everything that's going on in the world. Man, it's not that those things are not important and that we shouldn't be spending some important time thinking about all of those things, but God calls us in a practical way really to love and to serve our neighbor. And that is how the kingdom of God expands. And that is how heaven adds to its number. And so as Christians, we we look to heaven to give us a perspective for how to live right here, right now, with my neighbor. But secondly, the diversity of heaven ought to deepen our love and our prayers and our investment in what God is doing all around the world. The passage implies that there will be people from every people group in heaven. This isn't just every country. This is every kind of distinct people group within, within the country. There are, are places in the world where there's millions and millions of people who will wake up, go to sleep, do that every day of their lives, and never, ever meet another Christian. The Joshua Project, who studies all this stuff, estimates that there are 40, that 42% of the people groups in the world fall into this category of unreached. And these are people for whom this judgment in the book of Revelation is coming, and people for whom Jesus died that can be added uh, to the number of heaven. And so that ought to break our hearts. And so as Christians, we can pray for the world. We ought to pray for the world and we can figure out what God's doing in different parts of the world and join in in some meaningful way and partner with what what God's doing in the world. And for some of us, God might even be calling us to go to some of those places. 